Warning, the following program has been rated T for truth. You can't handle the truth. Oh, we think you can. Welcome to the Naked Truth Report with your host, truth warrior and myth buster, Kathleen Wells. The place where we distinguish fact from fiction, where data is used to drive points home, and where Kathleen takes the position that Democrats and black politicians have destroyed black America. Welcome to the Naked Truth Report. Now, your host, Kathleen Wells. Ah, welcome, truth warriors and myth busters. It's me, Kathleen Wells, your host of the Naked Truth Report. Um, today I will title the show, Face It, Colin. Democrat voters are ignoramuses. <sighs> Am I? It, yeah. How do I know that? How do we know that? Because, uh, well, you know, I was listening to Leo Terrell on Mark before I came to the show, Life, Liberty, and Le- Levine. He has been so passionate. Leo Terrell is a civil rights attorney. He's always passionate for uh, people who have been victimized, who, people whose civil rights have been violated. And generally, they have been. He, I put it this way, Leo Terrell has traditionally been on the side of the Democratic Party, on the left. He's been on that side, traditionally, all consistently. But now he's come out. Did you guys see that? He's come, and he's very passionate. He's come out against the Democratic Party. I I loved it. I loved that segment because Leo Terrell is quite passionate, and he expressed and he explained why. He explained why. He explained that Black Lives Matter, which I've said before, does not have the interest of Black Americans. No. For one, he didn't mention that they're funded by Soros. He may have. But most importantly, I think he pointed out the fact that why, if you're interested in black lives and you don't defend the life of black children, you're not interested in black lives. Angela Stanton was on. Angela Stanton and I interviewed. Remember I went to Hold the Feet to Your Fire? I went to that thing in D.C. I interviewed Angela Stanton um, and I played that interview. Well, she was, and you can see that interview on my YouTube channel, The Naked Truth Report. We talked about how the Democratic Party uh, does not uh, is pro-abortion, and how Margaret Sanger was for the genocide of Black Americans, and we are being genocided, if that's a word, genocided is that a word, uh, via abortions. That's one thing. But Leo Terrell, Angela Stanton was on with The Breakfast Club, and you can Google that and see it. It's a beautiful interview. She's she's running uh, against John Lewis in Atlanta. Uh, She had uh, some really interesting things to say. She knows her stuff. She knows the issues. The Breakfast Club is very popular. a very popular radio show that, uh, let's see, young folks, when I say young folks, I, that means people younger than me. <laughs> That's most people. No, I'm kidding <laughs> at this point. But, you know, folks in their 20s and their 30s and maybe in their 40s listen to The Breakfast Club. for the, They're familiar with it. They know what's going on. They know the host. They know what they cover. And that's the same show that, uh, and the host, one of the hosts is Charlemagne the God. Just his name makes Charlemagne. Who names themselves Charlemagne the God? This is someone you can't take seriously. But Joe Biden went on uh, the Breakfast Club and also Hillary Clinton. So so every four years they have political politicals, politicians on the show, or they talk politics. So they had um, Hillary Clinton on the show when she ran four years ago, and that's when she talked about having hot sauce in her purse. Okay, so uh, Charlemagne the God interviewed her now, and also Kamala Harris was on the Breakfast Club. So that's the place where people go, where you get a large swath, where a large swath of black Americans listen to that show, tune in, and so that's why these politicians go to the show. Uh, Let's see, that's where uh, Kamala Harris went and said that she smoked a, she smoked weed. I think she went on, (laughs) you know, they're always trying to pander, you know, that they're cool. Hillary Clinton, I have hot sauce in my purse, so therefore I'm cool and vote for me. 
Uh, Kamala Harris, I smoke weed, so therefore I'm cool, so vote for me. And Joe Biden, he went on with Charlemagne the God. You ain't black unless you ain't you ain't black unless you vote for me or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. So therefore, vote for him because otherwise you aren't black. Well, that really pissed off Leo Terrell. What Joe Biden said. I mean, he was really pissed about that because that's totally, totally. I mean, it's absurd. It's pandering. I guess that's what he called it. They're pandering to black American voters. And that's why I say, that's why I want to title this show, Face It, Colin. Democrat voters are ignoramuses. Uh, The other reason why I want to say they're ignoramuses is because they don't know the relevance and importance of history. The folks taking down statutes. We know on this show, you truth warriors know that, uh, let's see, Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural speech explicitly stated that the Civil War was f- – in this speech, despite what the academicians say or despite what historians have – how they've revised history, despite that, we know that Abraham Lincoln said in his second, second inaugural speech – it's a 900-word speech – he said that the Civil War was fought explicitly because of slavery because they wanted to enslave. But the academicians, the historians, like to revise history, rewrite it, and make it seem like America is like, you know, screwed up and uh, a bad country. If she's so bad, uh, why don't you go to a better country, I think? I feel that way. You come, you become, and someone said to me, oh, well, Kathleen, you're saying what white folks say to black folks, and it's so racist. Well, people evolve and change when they get more information. And I feel, my father fought in World War II, I feel, and I think Leo Terrell feels also because he says he loves America. These liberals, these people, on these radicals, and the Democrats, they hate America. I've had nothing but opportunity in America, going to all the schools that I've gone to. Uh, I feel like I've had nothing but opportunities. I wouldn't have these same opportunities in other countries, no. Would I have an, a radio show in another country? Most, most, most other countries, no. Being able to talk about what I want to talk about freely, no. Not most other countries. As I, as I said before, most other countries are one race, okay, so we've come a long way. We evolve. We change. And something Dennis Prager says is that uh, you don't. I think it was in the uh, Bible. Yes, how they talk. Moses was wise for his generations. This is something I heard uh, Dennis Prager say. In other words, one is assessed by their generation. Our generations plural. You don't assess or judge folks. Uh, outside of their generations, because I'm sure we will be assessed uh, 150 years from now. They're going to assess us. They'll probably judge us for eating meat, or they'll judge us for having abortions. Do you see 150 years from now? Do you see? Because um, there will probably 150 years from now there will be definitive proof that an embryo or a fetus is alive is a human being 150 years from now. It will be definitive. And so we will be judged 150 years from now, if not sooner, by the fact that we killed babies. Do you understand? Also, something that I was reading, I found out that um, gender blending and being gender fluid, these and these uh, gen- reversal of gender roles has gone on in history before. This isn't the first time. So these folks that, uh, you know, like, I can't remember what I read. I was reading The Art of Seduction, and he was talking about that. I can't remember exactly uh, what era he was speaking about, maybe the Roman Empire. Um, but I don't know. I can't remember. I was reading that. But, but nothing, nothing is new under the sun. Why don't you want to pull down statues? Because history matters and is important. You want to know history. Otherwise, what? You repeat it. And we're seeing the repeating of history, how? With Black Lives Matter. 
Is Black Lives Matter not the Black Panther movement plus trans rights? Back in the 60s, back in the 70s, the Black Panther movement uh, didn't talk about trans rights necessarily, but they were definitely Marxist. And we know that Black Lives Matter is Marxist. And we know we know when we look at history, when we study and research history, that Marxism hasn't worked. We've known that for at least 100 years, right? We know that because we're curious about information, about history. Therefore, we research it and we study it. Am I right? Am I right? So... I was so excited to see Leo. Leo Terrell has had a change of tune. He's a very passionate man. He's right here in Los Angeles. I'm going to try to get him on the show. I'm going to contact him. I reached out to Burgess Owen. I have, remember I said last week I would have him on the show, Burgess Owens, but I haven't heard from him. But I'll try to keep uh, reaching out, try, try to keep reaching him to get him on the show. And I also would like to bring Leo Terrell on the show because he's very passionate. He's, as I said, he's right here in L.A. Um, He said that he debated Cornel West. I'm going to Google because I'd like to see that debate. But the main thing that Leo Terrell was saying that if you don't talk about, I think in Chicago, if not Atlanta, Chicago, I meant he mentioned little babies, children, like ten years old, were shot. A little black baby, ten years old, a little girl, uh, had a bullet in her neck. and then a, a three-month-old baby, black baby, got shot. And it upset Leo Terrell that Black Lives Matter isn't speaking out against that. These women are not, these women who are mothers are not speaking out about a 10-year-old child being shot. I even saw, I remember a while ago I uh, read where a little boy, a little black boy was shot by some kids, and I, I think, what did, I can't remember, but they, like, uh, stuffed something down his throat or something, a little boy, black, killed in Chicago. And mothers who have children are not outraged by this? This is what I want to ask. Mothers who have children are not outraged by a three-month-old black child having a bullet shot? They're sitting in the car, and the bullet hits them? That doesn't infuriate you? Where is your humanity is the question. That doesn't infuriate the Black Lives Matter folks, which was founded by two lesbians. The notion that two lesbians are going to be interested in the welfare of black men is a stretch. I just, I can't believe it. But they had on, uh, let's see, I think he was on with Chris Wallace, Uh, His name is Hawk Newsom. This was a Black Lives Matter guy. He's not one of the founders, but he's one of the leaders in New York. Hawk Newsom is his name. Uh, And he mentioned, I was watching that, he gave a TED Talk. But this was the guy that said that if if Black Lives Matter, if we don't get what we want, we're going to burn the place down and and, and replace it. So the question is, uh, replace it with what? (laughs) <laughs> replace it with what? Black Lives Matter folks who don't know history. Uh, they don't know history because if they knew history, they wouldn't want to tear down Lincoln, right? If they're concerned about black lives. Black- Lincoln started the Civil War to free the slaves. So why would you take down Lincoln? Why? Because they believe in the revisionist history uh, that uh, Lincoln was not interested in ending slavery. That's why they're, they want to take down a statue, I'm assuming. But this Hawk Newsom, he, you know, he's changed his tune because when he gave his TED Talk, and they showed this on um, Chris Wallace showed portions of his TED Talk, or at least an, a quote from his TED Talk uh, previously, where he, men- he talked about being for nonviolence. But now he's talking about burning down uh, the place, uh, which is the place is America, burning down America if Black Lives Matter doesn't get what they want. Well, you know, Black Lives Matter is not representative of black Americans. They're a fringe group, but they've got, they're very vocal and they have a very large platform. And corporations are succumbing to their, 
to their influence, I should say, in a superficial way. And the Hollywood folks, and as I mentioned last uh, week, when you see the social uh, influencers, that's what they're called, social influencers, they're succumbing to it. In fact, on one of the social influencers that I watch, um, they asked they asked the uh, YouTuber why this was the why aren't you mentioning Black Lives Matter? See, this lets you know how the masses, the majority of people that follow, who are not truth warriors, the ma- the majority of people, Democrat voters and non-truth warriors, they're ignoramuses because they don't know anything relevant and material. They don't know that Black Lives Matters is a Marxist organization. They don't know that uh, only nine uh, unarmed black people were uh, shot by cops in 2019. And 19 unarmed white folks were shot by cops. And unarmed white folks were shot by cops in 2019. So that uh, where 43 million or 42 million black Americans, okay, we're 42 million black Americans. What ha- I've said this a thousand times. What happens to nine of us? Or what happens to one of us or a handful of us? I don't care if it's a 1,000. I don't care if it's 10,000. We're 42 million, okay, in law and in philosophy. The greater number is more important, has more weight, is more relevant. So I don't care if you say 10,000 black folks were abused by cops. I don't care because we're 42 million. Do you understand? But the thing of it is it's only nine in 2019. The other thing I wanted to say is that George Floyd, this is one of the things I want to say. George Floyd uh, had been arrested uh, for, uh, he's, he had more than one felony, and he was arrested for uh, robbing a woman inside her home at gunpoint. Now, you guys know that uh, I mentioned, I've mentioned that uh, someone came in my house and took the keys off my piano. We know it's probably my subcontractor's workers because how would they know the keys to the car were on the piano? But they came in the house because the back door was not secure because I was having the kitchen uh, renovated. And they walked into my house and stole my keys to the car and drove off with my car. You guys know I found the car because of what? The police. I called the police. And the police are needed. And in fact, I just read in my neighborhood app that someone just had their, this is in um, Baldwin Hills. They just had their car, their tires stolen off their car. You see, so the police, black people know, black Americans know that the police are needed. Uh, in fact, Dennis Prager uh, talked to the guy, I can't remember his name, I think his name is Ari, I'm not sure. But he did a documentary um, and interviewed folks in New York City. And let's see, the white liberals in New York City, in Manhattan, uh, want the police defunded and disbanded. But the black Americans in Harlem want the police. They realize the necessity of having police. So the issue is this. White liberals don't know what they're talking about. They're always talking about what they know about black America, but they don't know. And that's, a ve- that's, that's patronizing and arrogant, just like the Hollywood folks. They don't come down to Lamert Park. They don't come, Hollywood folks know nothing about what black Americans experience. These Hollywood elite folks. And yet they're always pandering and always embracing some cause. You know, I just heard that Black Lives Matters, they've taken in something like $460 million. And they're blackmailing, uh, uh, this is in Front Page magazine, they're blackmailing businesses. And that's what Leo Terrell brought up. And that's what Al Sharpton does. They're profiteering. Al Sharpton does it. They all do it. Cornel West, and I've mentioned that before. Michael Eric Dyson. Instead of talking about racism slash white supremacy, why doesn't Cornel West, Michael Eric Dyson, 
and Al Sharpton teach how the, teach these young black men to make the millions they make. But no, these folks are profiteering off of slogans and false narratives pushed by uh, push false narratives pushed that uh, black Americans are victimized in 2020 by America, by white supremacy, by racists, by uh, Republicans. This is the false narrative. They never cite data. They say white black Americans are victimized in 2020 uh, by America, by the Republicans, and by racist white supremacists. But they're never clear. So right after, they're never citing data, they're never specific. It's just these general overarching broad narratives that are false, that are pushed. And the gullible and naive and the non-research person and the person that lacks curiosity and doesn't study or doesn't research anything and has no curiosity to look things up in a deep way in a full way, they believe what they hear on TV. They believe everything they hear on TV. It's not possible that they're lying. I don't even know. I'm I'm surprised that people don't even question things. But as I mentioned last week, as soon as I, you know, when you say something, when, as soon as you say something like, well, you know, the Democratic Party has destroyed black America, these people that don't study, that lack curiosity, that no, don't research anything, they say, but Trump. As soon as you say, but the Democrats did that, they say, but Trump, or but the Republicans. We're not talking about Trump. We're not talking about the Republicans. We're talking about what the Democratic Party did. Well, I'm so happy to see that Leo Terrell has uh, had a change of tune. He's a very, very passionate man, and he gets, he goes, uh, he's in the media quite a bit. I'm going to try to get him on the show. Uh, When I come back from the break, we're going to take a break, but when I come back from the break, I want to talk about the fact that uh, Peter Strzok's notes This is a good thing. I'm going to just leave it at that. Peter Strzok's notes. So the title of today's show is Democratic Voters Are Ignoramuses. Yes, that's a good title. We'll be back uh, after the break, and we're going to talk. Oh, I want to do Balance of Nature. That's what Jeff just said in my ear. I want to, okay, you guys know that I I smoked on the download, or rather, I smoked cigarettes when I started law school. Yes, I'm embarrassed to admit it, but what's even more embarrassing is that I have continued to smoke. Okay, <laughs> that's more embarrassing. Uh, yeah, I sometimes do it on the down low and sometimes I don't do it on the down low, pretend, uh, depending on the uh, particular circumstances. But balance of nature has made my desire and craving to smoke cigarettes, uh, it has subsided. I'm no longer interested in smoking as much as I used to. I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to continue with balance of nature. I'm going to probably quit smoking like cold turkey. I believe I can do it. It's mind over matter. I think I can do the, do it. And with taking balance of nature, I have a new outlook on health. I have a new attitude about, I'm, em- I'm embracing a healthy lifestyle. Now I'm being the new Kathleen who lives a healthy lifestyle. And living a healthy lifestyle, you can't smoke, can you? So go to the naked truth bu- dot com, or rather balance of nature dot com and put in code, uh, truth. Naked truth. Put in code naked truth and you get 35% off uh, your balance of nature. It's a good thing. Balanceofnature.com, code NECA Truth, 35% off. I recommend it highly. We'll be right back. This America, sweet America. Yes, we love America. <laughs> we love America. You know why? Uh, let's see. When you're young, I, I I went to UCLA, folks, okay? 
I went to Berkeley Law School. I'm a black American woman. I grew up in Los Angeles. I gra- I went to Dorsey High. I graduated from Dorsey High School. But be- you know, before I went to Dorsey, I uh, was bused to Birmingham in on Havenhurst. I did that for a year, and I was even I was even a um, yell leader or cheerleader. I think I was a yell leader at uh, 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 Birmingham High School. I was the only black one. Can you, the only black one that sounds funny, but I was the. But you know what I'm saying is, and I've listen, listen. I've worked all over Los Angeles. I've worked in in Beverly Hills. I worked at the and when I was in when I was at in UCLA, an undergrad. I would work retail, so I worked at the Ann Taylor when it first opened on Camden. I worked at Bonwit Teller. Remember, there used to be a Bonwit Teller on uh, Rodeo Drive in Wilshire. I've worked all over. I've worked in law firms. I've worked everywhere. I've worked in Century City. I worked downtown. I've done everything. I've always worked. Even when I was in college, I would work, you know, part-time, that kind of thing. I've had all kinds of jobs. I've worked in Hollywood. I've worked in for uh, production companies in Hollywood. I've worked at Warner Brothers. I've worked at Oppenheimer. I've worked so many places. I have a lot of experience, and I'm a lot older than I look. But going back to, um, so this is why I feel like I've worked in New York. I've worked in San Francisco. When I was in Berkeley, I worked in San Francisco. I feel like I have had excellent opportunities. I've had excellent opportunities. Everything that I wanted to do, I've done. And I will continue to do. I don't feel like, and Leo Terrell said the same thing. I don't feel like I've been precluded from doing anything. If I set my mind to do something, I did it. If I wanted to get a job, I got a job. I worked since I was 15 years old. My first job was at a jean store on Crenshaw Boulevard. I think it was owned by a Korean couple like uh, 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 Crenshaw and Vernon. That was my first job. I used to, when I was a teenager, ride the bus because I loved clothes and retail and all that stuff when I was young. I used to ride the bus up to Hollywood Boulevard looking for a job in retail. There used to be a store on, I'm remembering, on Hollywood Boulevard called Miss Amba. I think I worked there. I can't even remember. But I've worked in Century City. I've worked everywhere. And I never felt, I've worked at jean stores and fancy stores. I worked at Bullock's Wilshire. I've worked at iMagnon. I've worked everywhere, literally. I've worked at many law firms. I've worked at uh, many things. I can't even remember all, but I've always had a job. I never felt like, and you know, and it was so easy to get a job, particularly at UCLA. You'd go to the UCLA placement office and you find a job. Okay. It was so easy. I worked as a paralegal before I went to, the year before I went to law school, I worked at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher as a paralegal for a whole year. And then the following year, I went to law school. I've never, anything that I wanted, I got. In fact, that's what my dad used to say to me. Kathleen, have I, he would say, have I ever denied you anything? You know, I can't imagine feeling oppressed. I've never felt oppressed. I've never felt that way. And I'm a black American woman. Now, I know people do feel that way. And maybe it's because of their attitude. I don't know. I don't know. But, I, you know, I was raised in Lamert Park. And I will say that my neighbors were, my neighbor was my like my Aunt Betty. She was a white, Betty and Clyde. Aunt Betty and Uncle Clyde. They were white and they sort of like raised me because my mom would work periodically. And when I would come home from school, I'd go to Aunt Betty's. And then across the street were the Takayamas. This is how I grew up in Lamert Park. So maybe this was, maybe I didn't feel any kind of reluctance to go out in the world and make my way and explore my curiosity because of how, because I was raised next door to Aunt Betty and Uncle Clyde and across the street, the Takayamas. Maybe, I don't know. And maybe most blacks aren't raised with a white next door and Japanese across the street. Maybe. I, that's possible. I, but I also think it's my personality. 
I, I've always been curious and I've always been a go getter. And if I saw something I wanted, I just go out and get it. That's always been my personality. If I wanted to do something, if I wanted to experience something, I would just go and do it. I never felt any hesitancy about exploring or trying it. And maybe that's just my personality. I don't know. But I never felt like, oh, I'm black. I can't do this. I never felt that way. I never felt oppressed. Anyway, let me take a call now from Brent in L.A. Hi, Brent. Welcome to the Naked Naked Truth Report. Hi, Kathleen. You are on fire tonight. You're just smoking. (laughs) We have so much to talk about. I always laugh when you call Brent. You know, you make me laugh. (laughs) Oh, good. But what I I was going to start with is you misquoted Dennis Prager. Okay. It was Noah. Not oh. Moses. Oh, okay. Was righteous in his generation. Yeah, I was using my uh, balance of nature memory pills, you know, because uh. I didn't have notes. But I remember him saying that, and you're absolutely right. Noah, exactly. I said Moses. You're right. Thanks for correcting me. Go ahead. Yeah, but what it made me think of it, why to call in on it, it was also, by the way, it was Moses who killed a corrupt Egyptian cop who was killing an old woman, as you recall. So it's sort of interesting where they were, there was a time where, you know, Police corruption goes way back. Right. That doesn't mean cops are bad in general, especially in this country. Right. Um, and so, but it's, it's so interesting, when being righteous in one's generation, just you know, this whole mantra that keeps going on and on and on with George Washington owned slaves and Jefferson owned slaves. And it, yeah, they did. It was part of the culture. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee the slaves who lived at Monticello or at Mount Vernon were treated a whole heck of a lot finer than the average person in the country at that time. Well, I don't so, want, you know, you can't say that. I know what you mean, though. But you, I don't even like to go into the sort of like, uh, I don't want to say false equivalences, but comparing and you know it's not it's like you get into bad territory comparing anything to slavery. Do you know what I no, mean? I'm, you know what I mean? No, in no way does that justify slavery. Right. I'm just saying it, it, when one is judged by their generation, how they were behaving. Noah had a lot of problems, but relative to everybody else, he obviously saved the world. Right. And, I mean, everything is relative, and you must put it in context. Mm-hmm. And. You, you were talking also about um, Black Lives Matter mm-hmm. and uh, Vulture Newsom, how, as I call him. Yeah. And how Black Lives Matter, it's a Marxist group. And Marxism is socialism, which is slavery. And they pretend they have a problem with slavery, but clearly there's no problem with the slavery that we actually have in America still today with the child sex slaves that come across the border and it's a multi-billion dollar industry in this country, probably a 100,000 sex slaves, and th- those w- that won't be discussed for right. any of the slaves in Africa. Right, right, right. They cherry-pick information. In fact, Angela Stanton, when she was on The Breakfast Club, she brought up pedophilia. You see, mm-hmm. they, you know, the sexualizing, the Democratic Party or liberals or the left sexualize children. And they think it's okay to change your sex, decide to change your sex at 11 years old. Things like that. See, yeah. they p- cherry pick information and they constantly push false narratives. Thanks for calling, Brent. Uh, let's take Carlos. Uh, welcome to the Neck of Truth Report, Carlos. Yeah, good evening. Well, you know, just like you, I was, uh, I've been a worker myself. You know, I came here uh, from Mexico at a young age, but I started selling newspapers. I was a printer at the age of 15. I went into the military, spent a year in Vietnam. Then I I became a probation officer. I went into real estate. I was in aerospace. I was a security guard at the age of 70. So I I know I identify with you, and I never felt oppressed. Right, I think, and it, and I think experiences like that. When you have broad experiences, you have a broad view of things. Exactly. I yeah. never felt depressed. I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm grateful to this great country that gave me all these different opportunities exactly. to work at so many different things. But I wanted to tell you something. In the ni- in 1913, a-, a congressman, Thomas Abernathy, introduced into the congressional record what they called, there was a blueprint written uh, for to use uh, 
responsible for racial tensions in the 20th century, utilizing uh, the minorities, especially Afro-Americans, to, to, uh, and, and uh, 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 inculcating them in, in uh, the, the sense of oppression so that they could be utilized then to destabilize the country and create revolutions just as we're seeing now. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no, exactly. There's nothing new under the sun. I think that black Americans have been used as a cudgel or to trigger off things consistently because they can buy into the idea that they've been oppressed. And we were oppressed as slaves. But this is 2020. Things have evolved. Things have changed. But I think they use us. and abu- The Democratic Party has used and abused black Americans forever and a day, and they continue to use us. Well, historically, they've used all these, all these uh, Afro-American icons like Brad Brown, Stokely Carmichael, mm-hmm. uh, Ralph Bunchy, Ella Baker, all, Angela Davis, as icons who, who, who the, the black communities looked up to, but in reality... They were being utilized by the Marxist organization. Exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Even Paul Robeson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were all Marxists. Stokely Carmichael, they were Marxists. And now we have evolved and learned that Marxism is not a good thing. I mean, when you're in undergrad and in, in UCLA, you think it's maybe not so bad. But as you grow up and evolve and become wiser, you realize it's a, and you learn more history, you realize Marxism is a bad thing. Thank you, Carlos, for calling in. Okay, Manny, uh, welcome to the Neck of Truth Report. Hi, Manny. Well, thank you for welcoming me. I'm anxious to talk to you. Um, it's so hard to get through to, to talk show hosts nowadays. And uh, I feel that to uh, from what you've said, that you are pretty well connected. But I have several different things that I'm trying to promote. But the, the one thing that comes to mind right now that I think is the most important is the fact that we're today, this is 2020, we're still using a technology from the 15th century to subdue people. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. You think about it. You could pick up a 1940s comic book and find much better ideas about how to control people that are out of line. Uh, perhaps you'd have a Spider-Man type uh, apparatus, a ray gun, a uh, suspended animation gun. Um, it, it, it just beyond my comprehension that we're still talking about firearms. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Do you understand what I'm saying? No, I don't know what you mean exactly. I'm saying that when some, let's say a, a policeman is trying to stop someone who's mm-hmm. done something, mm-hmm. and, and they flee, you let them go, you shoot them, that's it, there's nothing in between, that's it, that's the whole bit, you have to kill somebody because they're not cooperating. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. There well, I mean, if, listen, let me tell you something. Well, you know, when the guy came in my house to st- take the keys off my uh, piano, what uh, if he had a gun? Well, maybe it would mean if he has a gun, you need a gun. I'm just saying that if somebody is 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 uh, not cooperating, does it mean they should die? Well, uh, well, but the thing of it is, is that there are not that many instances of police brutality. Well, well, there were nine cases. There were nine uh, cases last year. Nine. And do you know how many? That's not. No, 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 no. That's not police brutality. That's killing somebody. Well, I'm just In terms saying. Of police brutality. It's been going on for a long, long time. No, how it long has have not. you lived in Los Angeles? How long have you lived in Los Angeles? Since I was born. And when was that? In the fifties or one? Well, no, I don't like to say my age because I'm a lady. Well, I like okay. to, I like people Can to I think I'm young. Can I go back to that decade? I go back to the 40s. I'm kind of no, old. I realize but, that police brutality has been an issue since the 30s in the urban areas. I know that. Well, it's, it's probably worse than that. What I'm saying is uh, it, it, get, just because someone gets killed, that doesn't mean that uh, that's not brutality. That's pretty, you know, almost murder. If you've ever read, don't get hung up on semant- semantics. The is- don't get hang up, hung up on semantics. The issue is this. Uh, black Americans are not brutalized by police. That's not a widespread problem. Why are we even talking about it? 
the numbers don't because make it. Because everybody's got that on their mind right now. But because the media yeah. has manipulated, because the majority of people are easily manipulated. Not Did because it's true. It's a false narrative. You don't, the media is pushing a false narrative. The, the 43 million. The LA Sentinel? Huh? Did you ever read the L.A. Sentinel? Yeah, and in fact, I even uh, I, I interviewed with Danny Bakewell or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, I don't recall hardly ever, and I mentioned this because I live in Beverly Hills, but I used to get out to the West Adams area quite often. Right. That's where I lived before, and uh, or I'd hang out because I liked jazz when I was a teenager. Uh, around, say, La Brea and Jefferson and, you know, those kind right, of places. Right. And I'd pass by a newsstand, and every single day I looked, I looked at the Sentinel, there was a, often a front-page story about police brutality to black people. Right, but it that was, was like in the 70s or something. This is 2020. Well, it was the 50s or 70s. It's, I don't know if they still publish it. But, but yeah, they still publish the Sentinel. It happens all the time. Well, no, but you I told to... you the numbers, Manny. You're not listening. I told you the numbers. You told I to- me about murder numbers. You didn't tell me about police brutality numbers. What I'm trying to say is I was hoping you could become an ally and try to do something about developing non-lethal weapons. Oh, my gosh. No, that's a whole other philosophical issue, okay? It's, it's a whole other story. But if the police had them and used them, we wouldn't have... Wait, there's no problem with police. Either. 98% of the police are kosher. They're cool. Okay, Manny. Okay, thanks for calling in. Okay, Joel, uh, welcome to the Naked Truth Report. Oh, hi, hi Kathleen. Thanks hi. for taking my call. Yeah, I just wanted to tell you about my the first time I, I heard Leah Terrell... Uh, speaking like a somewhat conservative, I was listening to a talk show uh, uh, on a radio, and I heard this guy that sounded like Leah Terrell, and I was going to change it because I know I get kind of get tired of Leo talking like a crazy Democrat sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, I, I listened for a, a few seconds, and uh, and this guy was speaking as somewhat of a conservative. And I thought, this can't be real. It can't be. And then, then a few seconds later, it's, uh, he, inter- you know, he said his name. I said, I just couldn't believe it. You know, it was, it was so funny. He's funny, isn't and, uh, he? He's a passionate uh, guy. He feels strongly uh, about uh, his he, issues. I, you know, even when he speaks like a Democrat, sometimes I listen to him because he's entertaining. Yes. He's very entertaining. He gets very heated. You know, so I'm glad oh, he's yeah. come. He's seen the light, so to speak. He's had his come to Jesus moment. <laughs> You well, know, you, know yeah. you got to give the man a, a lot of credit for publicly coming out like like he's coming out now. You know, it's a, I, I, I have a lot of respect for him now, a lot of respect. Yeah, and I'm going to try and get him on the show. He'll probably, let's try and get, I'm trying to get Burgess Owen. I'm going to try to get Angela Stanton and Leo Terrell on the show. Uh, they're, those are three black Americans that I would love to have on the show. Who We've all, listen, most black Americans were Democrat. We've all... Yeah. Seen the light, okay? We've seen the light. We've had a conversion because the Democrat Party ain't happening, folks. It's not working for us. If there's no progress, you move on. You don't keep trying to gild the lily or whatever that expression is. Anyway, uh, next week, let's hope I get Leo Terrell or Burgess Owens. Because that'll be fantastic. I know you guys don't want to hear me all the time. So that's what we're going to do. Thanks for listening. This is the Naked Truth Report, and we'll be back next week.